I've worked at a graveyard for the past 15 years and most of those years being the typical graveyard shift which was from 11pm to 7am. In my mind working overnight had many more benefits than working during the day. Day workers had to do more because people would be visiting the yard and there would be burials taking place a few times a week that needed to be arranged and above all else night shift gets paid an extra two dollars an hour. I've seen a lot during my years working night shift though. Mostly teens messing around, occasional drunk group of friends daring each other to walk through the graveyard. However, this night was different. I got to the small faculty building a bit early to chat with the day worker and once he left I did all of my normal checks and precautions at the beginning of my shift. Afterwards my only job is just to really drive around in a golf cart every so often and just make sure there's nothing going on. I'd say I only encounter something once a month and maybe even every other month. Anyway, the first few hours were normal. I drove around several times then went back to the small faculty building to eat my lunch. I think it was at around 2am when I went back out to do another round of the yard. As I got to the far end I saw something by the fence. It was obviously really dark so I couldn't really see much more than the general shape of a figure just standing there. I drove up closer and I could tell now that it was a man standing on the outside of the fence looking toward me. I didn't want to confront him if I didn't have to so I turned around and drove in a small loop around the lot to see if he would try to hop the fence while I was gone but when I got back after 30 seconds he was gone. I scanned the area briefly to make sure he didn't sneak in but it all looked clear so I continued with my patrol. Going through the whole yard takes about 15 minutes but sometimes I'd go slower just to pass the time. I went all the way around and decided to check back on the spot where I saw the man. I really didn't have anything better to do anyway. Started driving down there and almost immediately I spotted the man again. He was inside the yard, standing on the gravel path. I drove up closer again but the man didn't move. I exited the golf cart and started walking up to him. He looked like a 40 year old man. I stopped just a few feet away from him. Sir, you can't be in here, I'm going to have to ask you to leave or escort you out. I said, but he didn't even turn his head to look at me. After a second, a slight rush of fear went through me. Sir, I'm going to need you to come with me. I reached my hand out and gently tapped him on the shoulder. As soon as I did, he whipped his head around to look at me. He just stared into my eyes. He looked so full of rage. I took my hand away and the man turned around and started walking away. I got back on my golf cart, preparing to call the police as I watched him go all the way down to the fence. He stepped over it and continued walking away. I was relieved but still felt terrified. I drove back to the faculty building and went inside. It was a small single room, security type building, but I felt a lot safer and calmer inside. I sat down and I caught my breath. In all my years, I'd never really been scared because it was always just people messing around, but this was different. I waited inside for a while. I'm not sure how long until I heard a bang on the door. I jumped out of my chair and stared at the door in fear. A few seconds later, they banged on the door again. These were aggressive knocks, not those of someone being friendly. I had nowhere to go. I picked up the desk phone and called 911. I didn't know what they wanted or why they were here, but I certainly wasn't going to risk it all to find out. After about probably three minutes of them banging on the door, I heard them walk away. I still waited for the police to arrive before I opened the door. The following day, my manager was able to pull the CCTV security footage from the building, and what I saw was horrifying. Just minutes after I entered the building, the man I'd seen in the yard earlier walked up to the door. He stood there silently for nearly 15 minutes before he banged on the door. He was also holding something in his hand, but the footage wasn't detailed enough to make out the object. It was likely a small pipe or a bat of some sort. The man was never identified, but I still worked the same job at the graveyard and I haven't seen him since. First of all, let me just say, this is not an indictment of OnlyFans. If someone wants to profit from sharing pictures of themselves, of their own body, that's totally their right and I respect that. I'm not casting judgment on anyone who chooses to do so. But let me be clear, OnlyFans just about ruined my life and I've never even set up a profile. It all kicked off not long after I broke up with this guy I'd been dating for about three to four months. As a single mum, it's hard to get dates than I'd like it to be. But at the same time, I totally understand why somebody wouldn't want to raise a child that isn't theirs. I mean, I wish more guys would be open to it. It's not like I'd never have a kid with them too. But it's just a sad fact that it puts guys off when you've got a child from a previous relationship. So you can imagine how excited I was when I met Richard. It's not his real name, by the way, but I'd rather not attract his attention. Thank you very much. 
Having a six-year-old son didn't seem to bother him in the least bit. He even asked a lot of questions about him. I found the whole thing quite refreshing and mature that by the time Richard asked me out, I just about bit his arm off accepting the invite. But then the first red flag appeared when he started making comments about my son calling him daddy. That wasn't the red flag in and of itself, but it was more his reaction when I told him, no, my son has a dad and I don't want him confused as he grows up. Richard didn't seem to respect that position whatsoever and actually said some quite personal things regarding my taste in men, as well as the integrity of my son's father. It's a complicated situation that I'll concede, but Richard's whole take on the thing was frankly disgusting and misogynistic, but given that it was a very unusual setup, I didn't really want to give up on him so quickly. Not since guys like him seem to be so hard to come by, but then after two months of clashing, not often I should add, I had to face the music and accept that if there was a guy out there for me, it certainly wasn't him. I've dated guys for months who took the breakup better than Richard did. They're always rough, but I think if I actually told you what Richard did, you'd think I was making this all up. Needless to say, his reaction totally justified my decisions to end things. And that's exactly how I phrased it too. But that breakup was far from the end of my ordeal with Richard. And you know what? It's kind of my fault too. In fact, it's mostly kind of my fault because if I hadn't been so trusting, I wouldn't even be writing this right now. The one big mistake I made was trusting Richard to keep private certain pictures I'd sent to him. I think I trusted him because, well, he sent me pictures too. And I think there's a lot of less nude leaks than there are nudes. The mutually assured destruction, you'll release mine, well, I'll release yours. But after we broke up, I deleted all of his intimate pictures. And I was foolish enough to think that he'd also done the same. Because the next thing I know, I get a message from a friend of mine saying something like, Oh, you have an OnlyFans. You go, girl. I had to ask her what OnlyFans was. I literally had no idea at the time. And she replies, you, like, you're joking, right? Is this supposed to be a secret? Immediately, I started Googling OnlyFans, and as you can imagine, I'm pretty shocked at what I see. The whole website is basically homemade lewd images, and for those who aren't familiar, and from what I could gather, the girls in question make quite a lot of money too. I mean, I wouldn't say no to an extra two grand a month, but I hadn't even set the profile up. I asked my friend to send me anything she found with my name on it, and then, what do you know? There's a freaking OnlyFans profile set up in my name and the whole preview picture in the banner was a raunchy picture that I'd sent to Richard. The profile said free to subscribe, so I made a dummy account to sign up, only to discover that Richard must have uploaded at least 10 different pictures I'd sent to him, all with these disgusting captions that I'd rather not repeat here. I was angry. I was so angry. But I didn't get scared until I saw that he'd put up my home address, my actual home address. Apartment number, postcode, everything. It kicked in how much danger I was in and I burst into tears, thinking that my selfish little actions had exposed my only son to danger. I know it was all Richard, and I know if he was just normal, then yeah, it wouldn't have happened. But I'm a mother. I should know better. I'm not some attention-seeking teenager anymore. I just wanted to feel wanted, you know? Surely people can understand that. In the end, I managed to get the profile taken down and I think OnlyFans and other sites like that now make you verify your identity so stuff like that can't happen again. But what if you manage to get hold of the girl's ID or something? The system they have doesn't completely protect anyone. Like I said at the start, I don't mean to judge anyone who wants to do that kind of thing. I just hope that they have their safety and security in mind because as I think we all know, there are some serious psychos out there. All right, so I've got a story that made me learn a lot about using Craigslist. This is just after the new iPhone had come out and I desperately wanted one. So I found an ad on Craigslist from a guy selling his for about $50 cheaper than everyone else's ads. I give the guy a call and he tells me his company has switched to using Blackberries and he has no need for the iPhone now. So I agreed to meet up with him since he seemed to have a fairly straightforward story, or at least it sounded that way. This happened in LA and I'm not familiar with the LA area. I drive up and get off on Crenshaw Boulevard on the northeast side. I drive up about a block from the 405 and take a left and park in front of this big low-income apartment complex. This is in the middle of the day, right next to a busy street. Now, the neighbourhood wasn't bad, but I'm a big girl, so I figured I'd be alright. I finally get a hold of the supposed business dude, which turns out to be a little dude that's dressed in baggy jeans and a big white t-shirt. 
along with another dude just the same. Now, while I was sitting in my truck waiting for the guy to show up, I see a, a guy sitting over in a blue Ford Focus just staring at me and grinning the entire time, which creeped me out and already made me feel uneasy about the situation. Once I saw the business guy, I knew something wasn't right and I decided to try and get out of there as fast as possible. So I started walking back to my truck, telling him how I'm going to go grab the cash for the iPhone. But when I get back to my truck, I try to put my keys in the ignition. The other little dude jumps into my passenger side and sticks a gun in my face, saying, No homie, you ain't leaving. Gonna need everything you got. Now this is probably stupid on my part, but seeing how this kid was holding the gun almost clumsily, and it looked more like a metal air soft gun as opposed to a real gun, I decided to reach across, open the door and shove him out. I did it so quickly he didn't have time to react and was already outside my passenger door, banging on the glass to let him back in. I figured I was good to go now and could get the hell out of there, but no. So I'm assuming when the second guy got thrown out, I was so focused on him, I didn't realise the first guy had gone to go get about five or six of his much bigger buddies, which were now all at my driver's side window, which I had halfway down. And as I turned my head towards them, they all just started reaching into my window, throwing punches, trying to grab me and pull me up. After what seemed like forever, trying to dodge punches and still trying to get my keys into the ignition to maybe get my truck going to get the hell out of there, it was no good. After a few good hits, they connected with my head and I started to see stars. I got dazed and decided as a last ditch effort to throw the cash I had for the iPhone all over the ground outside behind them. They immediately stopped attacking me and ran around picking it up, which gave me the opportunity to get the hell out of there. I did go down a few blocks and realised I couldn't even see straight. I called the LA County Sheriff, which they came and thought I was part of a big drug deal gone bad. But it ended up being these tweakers had done the same thing to eight other victims and stole their licences, saying that if they went to the police, they would kill their families. So yeah, I won't be using Craigslist ever again. For a few months, I worked a night shift at a 24-hour gas station in northern West Virginia. It was a Wednesday night. It started like any other normal shift at work, any day of the week. A few people stopped in here and there, mainly buying lottery tickets and paying for gas. Forward it a few hours, it was 3am and the traffic had died down a little bit. I was sitting up front when I watched a maroon Lincoln sedan pull into the parking lot and park in the back behind all the gas pumps. It was a couple of minutes later when a woman emerged from the front passenger seat who sort of stumbled out of the car and started approaching the gas station. I watched her as she walked in at a rather brisk pace, in a very nervous kind of fashion. I instantly noticed that her face was pale and she had sweat perspiring on her forehead. Mind you, it was the dead of winter and I'm pretty sure that the temperature was below zero degrees that night. She walked past the counter and headed straight towards the back to the bathrooms. She came out about five minutes later and her body language was really starting to concern me. She was kind of pacing back and forth in the aisles, occasionally peeking her head around and looking out the windows towards the car. Right as I thought about saying something, she walked right out of the door and headed in the direction towards the car that was parked across the lot. About five minutes went by and the car didn't move. But then suddenly the car went into reverse and did a 180 towards the gas pumps and parked beside one. The car was much closer now, so I was able to see the woman inside, who was accompanied by a man in the front seat. Another minute went by, then the passenger door sprung open, and the woman who previously came in began walking towards the building again. This time, when she walked by, it was becoming more and more obvious to me that something was wrong. She walked towards the counter, holding a $20 bill, and said, 20 on pump 5, in a quiet, shaky voice. I took it and continued to watch her body language, seeing that her hands were clenched in a fist, in addition to the sweat on her forehead. I looked at her with concern, and I think she noticed it on my face, not trying to make it obvious in case the man outside was watching me. I, w I said to her, is everything all right? And she looked up at me, not saying a word for at least five seconds, until she replied, yes, thank you. I didn't buy it, and continued to question her, saying, do you know who that guy is in the car? And she responded with, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's my, that's my boyfriend. I didn't believe any of this to be true, and I watched as she approached the car, right as she opened the passenger's door. The man handed her something, and she grabbed it and promptly turned backwards towards the building. She walked in and instantly went to the chip aisle, where she paced around again and eventually bought a bag of chips to the counter. 
I was finally able to make out what the man had handed her. It was a five dollar bill. I looked at her again with concern, but didn't want to continue badgering her. Also acknowledging the possibility of her temperament being from an argument or something. She slapped it down on the counter, then did something I never would have expected. She leaned in and reached towards the lighters, which are close to the back of the counter by me, and faintly muttered under her breath, I need help. Those words raised the hairs on the back of my neck and confirmed my suspicions. I casually replied, acting like I was ringing her out, and said, Do you want me to call the police? And she nodded her head. I pressed the panic button that was located under the counter, which alerted 911 of an emergency. Right after doing so, I looked up and I noticed that the girl was heading towards the exit. I ran around the counter and went straight for the door, just as she was about to walk out. I told her to stop and locked the door before she could leave. She instantly started crying and was clearly in shock from the whole situation. She kept repeating these words that still give me chills just thinking about it to this day. He's going to get mad. He's going to get mad. I told her to follow me and I took her to the back room where I dead bolted the lock shut, locking us both inside. I assured her that the police were on their way and everything was going to be okay. I had no choice but to remain calm in the situation because if I didn't, I knew she would freak out even more. However, the sheer feeling of panic continued to grow when the man suddenly started pounding on the outside door of the gas station, screaming the girl's name. This occurrence was enough to send her into total shock and she just sat down and became completely emotionless and silent. The pounding lasted for another few minutes until it finally grew quiet. I didn't know if the man had broken through or what, but I wasn't going to go out there and find out. A couple of minutes after that, the police arrived, kicked the back door down and eventually we came out. I was instantly separated from the girl who got picked up in an ambulance. I was taken to the police station to give a statement where I explained everything that happened. After that, I was sent home for the rest of the night and I didn't hear anything until a couple of weeks later. I found out online that the woman was being trafficked that night. She had been kidnapped about 45 minutes away in a Walmart parking lot. The article gave a description and a sketch of the suspect which looked a lot like the guy I saw the night in the car. Apparently the driver was heading south to wherever he was planning on taking her. The woman was able to convince the man to pull over so she could use the restroom. While he was there, he sent the girl back in to pay for the gas. The girl must have convinced him to let her get a snack, which explains why she came in the third time after she realised I could possibly help her. I've neither heard or spoken to this girl since that day. I don't consider myself to be a hero by any means, but I'm so glad that I was in the right place at the right time. I'm still a little shook from that night, even to this day. But I just hope that the victim of this horrific crime is doing okay. I used to work as a pizza delivery driver. I would only work on Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. I always preferred the weekend shifts, especially at night time, because that's when I would make the most money. At this point, I've been working there for the past year and had come to know many of the regular customers that I delivered to. On one particular Friday, I had just gotten back from a delivery when my boss handed me another box of pizza to deliver. I instantly recognised the address, seeing that it was a lady who almost religiously ordered pizza every Friday. According to my manager, she'd been doing it for years. On that job, I've learnt that a lot of customers like to chit-chat, and this lady was one of them. But I didn't mind, though, because she was always very kind and would often tip me very generously. She lived on her own and would always tell me she enjoyed having the house to herself, since it was quiet. Her house was ten minutes away from the shop, so I got in my car and I drove straight there. It was around eleven o'clock at night, which is usually the same time she'd always order. As soon as I got there, I pulled into the driveway, parking behind a red Kia Optima. The first thing I noticed was that her porch light wasn't on, which was unusual because she always had it on in the past. I assumed she must have just forgotten to turn it on. As I was approaching the house on the walkway to the door, I instantly froze in my steps. When I looked up, I realised that the front door was wide open. There were no visible lights coming from anywhere inside the house. It was completely dark. Hesitantly, I took a few more steps forward and stepped up onto the front porch, where I leaned my head in towards the entrance and yelled, Hello, is anyone home? I waited a few seconds but got no response. After seeing that the front porch light was off, I didn't really find anything else too strange, but after noticing the fully open front door and complete darkness inside the house, I was really starting to get scared. I found it quite hard to believe that all those strange signs were just a coincidence. As a last hope, 
Before I escalated the situation by telling my boss, I stepped inside the house and began calling for her. In retrospect, <laughs> this probably wasn't a good idea, but I walked around the first floor of the house looking for any signs of her. My only explanation at this point was that she had a medical emergency of some sort and needed help. I made my way into the kitchen where I found another red flag. Her phone was sitting on the countertop right next to the sink and her car keys were on the coat rack by the front door. Other than that, there were no signs of her. I thought about checking the upstairs level, but I started to get freaked out. I ran back to my car where I called my boss and while waiting for him to answer, I started getting really worried as I soaked in everything I'd just witnessed. I got a nauseated feeling in my stomach that something was seriously wrong. My boss finally picked up and I stumbled over my words, trying to tell him that I think something bad has happened to her. He told me just to come back to the shop and talk to him more about it because he was really busy with customers. I sped back as fast as I could where I practically ran in to attempt to tell him everything in a less panicked tone. After talking with him, he agreed that we should contact the police and have them send over someone for a welfare check. Well, weeks went by and we heard absolutely nothing from the police. The suspense and ominous tension was killing me, not knowing what happened. Several more weeks went by, which turned into years. I eventually quit that job and worked my way up into the career job I have today. Last month, by coincidence, I ran into my old boss from the pizza shop, who struck up a conversation for a little, before I finally brought up the elephant in the room. I said, Hey, whatever happened to that girl? His expression quickly changed into a blank look, and he sighed. I don't know. She hasn't ordered a pizza since that night. Later that day, I decided to drive over to the house I delivered to that night. There was a truck and a car parked in the driveway, and a lady sitting outside while her kids were playing in the yard. I parked on the street and walked up to the driveway, waving at her. I said, hey, I know this is kind of a weird question to ask, but do you know anything about the previous owner of this house? She looked puzzled as she replied, no. No, not at all. Our realtor just said that the house had been abandoned for a year before we moved in. I politely thanked her and walked back to my car with that same feeling I had in my gut years ago, the last time I was at that house. I still can't believe that after all these years, I still have no idea what happened to her. She just dropped off the face of the planet. I'm hoping that there's some logical explanation for this that I'll eventually find one day, but I just hope that she's doing okay. Out of curiosity, guys, what do you think happened here? Let me know in the comments.